Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. We've been having a phenomenal discussion that we have not clicked record for, so I think we need to make sure we capture all this brilliance that you're you're bestowing upon me <laughs> that was so insulting the way you just said that i feel i feel completely demoralized well, was, and patronized well you should victimized because it was it was not supposed to be negative in any way it was a so salute we were ta- to your vast knowledge on the subject <laughs> Now that just feels sarcastic. So, well, it wasn't. <laughs> so we were talking about we were talking about fertilization in oaks because um, we went on Gamekeepers. That episode aired today, uh, October thirty first. If y'all want to go listen to it, yeah. But um, the for guys October. over there for October, October. <laughs> hashtag um, somebody what a hashtag good name. it. Yeah, they probably already have, but. Uh, they were really pushing pushing us on the issue of, you know, that study that you were involved in, mm-hmm. where uh, basically reducing competition from surrounding trees and allow canopies of oak trees to expand increased acorn production better than fertilization, and really you weren't able to demonstrate any effect of fertilization. And they countered yeah. while we were on the show that we know that fertilization helps with a variety of other agronomically grown nut producing mm-hmm. trees. So it stands to reason that's a term that we've, we've really mm-hmm. started using a lot lately um, that it would in Oaks as well. And we were talking about some of the reasons why that may or may not be the case in the situation under which you would actually expect fertilization to have a positive impact right. on either the oaks, you know, overall growth and characteristics or even all the way down to what we care about the most, which Mm -hmm. is acorn production. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think uh, that was a great discussion and I love talking to those guys. Uh, they, they're really thoughtful about the way they go about questioning you. And, uh, you know, I've I've talked to Dudley at lengths about this in the past, not, not specifically about fertilizing oaks, but just oaks in general. And, no question he's one of the most knowledgeable people about that that i know well that's what i was going to say is because of their nursery they have so much more experience like intensively cultivating these trees than you and i do going out and cutting down trees that surround the ones we want to keep and monitoring acorns after that it's a completely different context yeah Yeah, and, and i think there's something to be said about that you know you get a lot of experience around oaks as hunters which we both have done you get a lot of context that's different from that from being a manager in that Mm -hmm. scenario you get a different perspective even again from being a cultivator so you know in that case with their nursery and i think that is super valuable and complementary to those others and then i think you get a different perspective again uh, you know, from the kind of work that we've been involved with over the long term, where we're re- you know trying to do it in a robust research design that we mm-hmm. can gain some inference about things. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's a lot of value in all of that. But what it did for me is really challenge me, and and I think I know you know this about me, but I think the audience probably does too. I I don't I don't really care what the answer is, but I need to know what it is. Mm-hmm. And I was involved in a lo- long research project with Craig's lab, you know, that we published that, that you were just talking about with white oaks. Yeah. But I'm not going to stand here and tell you that that is the be all end all that ever was. Right. That was a strong study. 
on White Oaks, and I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it, and so did a whole bunch of other people, uh, you know, to, to carry that project for 10 years to evaluate fertilization. And we didn't see an effect. I mean, it wasn't just, it wasn't much. We didn't have a dete- detectable difference mm-hmm. in fertilization, the fertilization treatment. It, while we had this, you know, the canopy release, we observed uh, up to 65% increase per individual in production from that treatment. So they're, they're not even close. So those were tears of joy that you cried as part of this project, <laughs> not well, tears of sorrow. Of you said you invested yeah. blood, sweat, and tears. I was wondering where the yeah. tears came from. <laughs> well, they there was probably some some points of of anguish and happiness in that. Uh, but I, I think there were there are some important things about that because I've been trying to reconcile it because it didn't. I, I mean, to be honest with you, it doesn't make that much sense to me either. Yeah. Because we have all these examples, like the orchard settings where we fertilize trees and we, you know, uh, expect there to be more mass produced, whether it be pecans or uh, citrus or whatever. So uh, I had some thoughts on that, which is when you told us, told me that we should be recording this conversation, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, with pecans or, or oranges or whatever, they, then that cultivated setting, we're often grafting the same individual onto many Yeah, stocks. so they're clones. Yeah, they're clones. They're literally the same individual genetically, and they we may have selected for individuals that are particularly good at utilizing additional nutrients. Right. Uh, so that was one thought, but... Uh, another thing that I did was start to try to look at other oak species. Is there anything out there on fertilization of other oaks? And actually, uh, I've dug up a few papers that we we acknowledged in the the one that you know the Brook et al. Mm-hmm. that we published on white oaks uh, that actually gave me some other cloudiness in the water, but also some <laughs> points of clarity at the same time, I think is the way I put it to you earlier. Yeah. Like it, this is definitely com. It's more complex than it seems. Mm-hmm. Uh, and w- what I mean by that, it, w- there are some clear ways that fertilization helps oaks. Yeah. That, that are pretty consistent when the plant is young and it's growing rapidly it can certainly benefit from fertilization to grow more rapidly and even increase survival in some cases. Yeah, because there's been multiple studies that have found that acorn production within a species is correlated with diameter and Mm -hmm. with uh, canopy size. And we know intuitively you add nitrogen to a tree, it's going to put on more diameter and expand its crown, given that it has enough space to do so at a Mm -hmm. faster rate than it would if it didn't if we didn't fertilize it. Right. So I don't think there's much uh, argument amongst people on that. I think that's pretty well settled. The growth rate uh, in particular is enhanced through fertilization. Yeah. So I started looking around at, well, what are, are there examples where, uh, acorn production was enhanced by fertilization and there are some uh, on other oak species one of them uh, was on bear oak and this was from like when was this published 1977 back mm-hmm. in the days when all the good stuff was done you know man there yeah. was a lot of good work done back in those days you know so people had people had good heads on their shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll leave it at that. <laughs> so bear oak, for those of you that are out there scratching your head at what I'm even saying, I'm literally saying B E A R bear. <laughs> uh yeah, because when you first said it, it, I thought it might be like B A R E. <laughs> yeah, or Burr, B U R R. Yeah. <laughs> so no, it's bear oak and 
I I didn't know where it was because you asked me where where is that oak even? At? <laughs> where does that even exist? <laughs> and I didn't know right off, but probably did, somewhere uh, where there's bears. Yeah, well, that turns out that's true. Uh, the other thing is, let's see, they did note for those of you out there that wild turkeys, ruffed grouse, bobwhite, gray squirrels, white-tailed deer, and black bears feed extensively on bear oak acorns extensively yeah they didn't even cite it they just <laughs> they just made it so it upon us <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you said it's um it's kind of like it's kind of like from the mid-atlantic it occurs from the mid-atlantic region up to maine right yes which the way they wrote it is the the opposite they're going from north to south but it, basically southern maine new york pennsylvania west virginia west western north carolina and virginia well i'm down so here in alabama so i start from the south and work my yeah. way north no i'm with you <laughs> that's the way i drive I, i'm so. sitting slightly south of you right now yeah. <laughs> um yeah so uh it basically that's the extent of its range so it's northeastern species primarily but you mentioned to me that it tends to grow on very poor soils yeah, that that was the other thing I was going to say. They described it as occurring on acid, rocky, or sandy, sterile soils, especially dry, sandy barrens or rocky hillsides up to 900 meters in elevation. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's pretty pretty poor site. I'm Stands guessing the there's probably not a lot of other things that, <laughs> that are flourishing in that environment, especially in terms of oaks. So, uh, yeah, th- they did a fertilization study in that one, and they were, well, first of all, on bare oak, apparently mature acorns are first produced at three growing seasons old. What? Isn't that something? You know, I just, uh, I hadn't posted it yet, but I got a, I got another really interesting, uh, set of images and, and footage from Quercus pumilla, runner oak. Have you ever been around it? Well, that's what I was, it's, it's exactly what I was about to say. I said, this sounds like runner oak. Yeah. I have been so, around it. Well, this bear oak is Quercus elisifolia. So this is a different species. But it is kind of like a low growing shrub. I'm looking yeah, it up right yeah. now. That's that's uh exactly the impression I got. Kind of like that runner it, oak. That it is a it is a dwarf oak. It's probably more like a dwarf live oak, is my guess. It's probably mm-hmm. not running as extensively no. from yeah. rhizomes. I, I wouldn't guess, but maybe it is. I don't know. But anyway, boy, that looks like can, a fire adapted tree to me. Yeah, well, and it, I mean that would be where fire would occur in that landscape. Absolutely, uh, it would have been frequent, probably. So, anyway, we got a super poor soil. This plant that grows to maturity rapidly, and they were fer- they started fertilizing, uh, with five. Let's see. 900 kilograms per hectare or whatever that works out to i don't i don't know the math on it but a 510 5 was applied in late march and that re- resulted in an increase in production of pistolate flowers immature acorns and mature acorns and nine-year-old and 13-year-old trees mm-hmm. so really young trees that are probably still growing f- really fast and in this context, they're also super poor soils. Uh, but they also noted that in their five-year-old trees, they did not observe an effect. So I don't know yeah. why it would occur on one and not the other. But the it other seems thing, like... the, the experimental design is not super strong in it either. Gotcha. We'll put, I'll put it that way. But it seems like this is a species of tree that is you know, evolutionarily or like, you know, from an ecology perspective, it's adapted to take advantage of resources and translate those into reproduction as quickly as possible compared to 
you know, what most of us are used to dealing with as far as an oak species perspective. These are much longer lived species that, you know, mm-hmm. they want to invest all of their resources into growth for many, many years before they even start thinking about trying to reproduce. But mm-hmm. if this is a tree that never gets very big, it grows on very poor soils, probably is fire adapted. It seems like its strategy is to grow as quickly as possible and reproduce and be done. Yeah. So it makes sense. I think you're right. So they, uh, in, in this study, they did observe, again, we've got to keep the context, that they did observe a, a an increase in acorn production. Mm-hmm. So that got my wheels really spinning because that was actually the yeah. first one that I dug up after uh, we had the discussion with, with the, the mossy oak guys. And I was like, oh no, maybe the white oak study is an outlier. What's going on here? <laughs> and then I found another one that I found extremely interesting. That This one was a really long-term experiment, and it was with Quercus rubra. So mm-hmm. uh, what is that? Uh, North is it Northern? That's Northern Red. Red. Yeah, they're they're just writing rubra everywhere. So uh, in this study, the, the the point of the study is not, or the treatments were not to study oak masting. It is a long term ecological research site at the Harvard Forest, and basically it has a fertilization treatment and a control. So in these plots, and they the the thing that well, let me point out this again to people. Last time you every told me every single it, last time you what? told me it was Yale. <laughs> and this time you said Harvard. It's one of them Ivy Leagues. <laughs> no, it's Harvard Forest. So I, I thought don't know you said about... I thought you said Yale last time. See, we're off they're the, all the off same. The air. They're all the same. They're all the same. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where those schools are. <laughs> I'm guessing you did not attend any of them. <laughs> I, t- I attended yeah. a pub. I attended a public ivy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there was some poison ivy around the one I went to. <laughs> Maybe a little yeah. English ivy too. <laughs> yeah, I tried to kill all of that I could. Uh, well, what I was going to say before you you so rudely interrupted me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what was I going to say? I'm so oh, sorry. All, the, all these studies, <laughs> all these studies, you, you can't do everything perfect. They, they right. all have weaknesses and strengths, and we should acknowledge those. Um, I think one for the bear oak that is a strength of that study is if we would have expected any oak on the planet to respond to fertilization, it ought to be the one that's growing out of a rock. You know? Yeah. It doesn't have anything to, to grab a hold of. Stands to reason. So anyway, this this study was not designed specifically for this purpose, but they did have plots that have been fertilized with nitrogen for twenty five over twenty five years. Mm-hmm. They've been doing it a long time. Yeah, right. So I think that's the real strength of this one. And they they were calculating uh, mass production in those plots. So. Uh, they don't have before after data, and that's a weakness. But they do have the control impact data, and it was over long term, so I think that should be noted. They saw in uh, the couple of years that they measured it, which was following this history of fertilization or not, uh, they found that the oaks were producing four to nine times as many acorns. Wow! In the fertilized pots. Now, the other thing that I found remarkable is that all of that extra production was negated. How so? Well, uh, there's this little insect called uh, Curculio, which is a little weevil that attacks the acorns on the tree. And they had a commensurate increase in destruction of the acorns while they were developing on the trees in the fertilized plots. So basically, the tree produced more acorns, but a whole lot more of them got eaten before they fell off the tree and were rendered. So it's basically a compensatory mortality. Yeah. So mm-hmm. basically you increase 
product investment in production, but uh, more of them got attacked by weevils. So there still weren't more seeds available for stuff on the ground. And uh, they actually recorded that fewer of the seeds germinated uh, so, in the plots that were fertilized. Is there reason to believe that that same that same process would play out elsewhere or was that just like a stochastic random chance event you think that happened in this particular study plot well these these were replicated so this was a consistent pattern across their their replication they said in here that it was so this wasn't just like one study plot they had these replicated spatially yeah and it you know, it's overall a pretty solid study, although it wasn't designed specifically for this purpose. I got and you. the reason I'm saying that it would have been nice to have data before either treatment occurred mm-hmm. to make sure there's not some inherent yeah. differences between them. But again, that they were taking advantage of the fact they've got plots that they've been doing this for 25 years on. I'm sure there's, there's probably all kinds of things published from these plots, I'm guessing. Yeah. You know, one of the things that comes to mind for me about this whole situation is I wonder if when we go out and do this type of experimentation in a naturally regenerated forest, um, are we just not able to tune into the signal for all the noise? You know, that's something that we talk about as scientists all the time, the signal to noise ratio. Like there's all -hmm. this noise out there and these are the things, those are the factors that we try to control doing you know, in the process of scientific research and just to tune in on the specific signal that we're interested in. But when you go in and you manipulate, like I said, a naturally regenerated mixed hardwood forest, is there just too much noise so that a treatment like fertilization doesn't, it just gets, it just gets uh, muffled out by all the other unaccounted for variation that those trees are experiencing? Uh I think there's probably something to that. But on the flip side, the effect of the effect of removing competing trees emits a clear signal. It, yeah, pretty much everywhere I've seen it. The the old time Healy work, I mean it's been foundational in every experiment that I've seen, a thinning or canopy release treatment. Yeah. has resulted in a response in, in mass production. So the effect size, or that would indicate to me at least intuitively, the effect size of reducing competition is so much greater than fertilization that you can't even find that fertilization signal unless maybe that you're in some kind of very controlled plantation setting, mm-hmm. you know, where it's easier to document because things are so much more consistent for each tree. Yeah. There may be something to that. I don't know. Another thing I just thought of is there may be consistent responses of the oak, for example, to the fertilization, but then there's a commensurate increase in insect damage, but that wouldn't occur in agriculture either because we commonly control Mm. insects. Mm. Good point. So, you know, there's all kinds of things going on. And this, I told you, uh, I don't remember what what conversation it was, but this is what we want our audience to be doing. This is the reason I'm not married to the idea that fertilization never works under any circumstance. Not at all. That's what our study indicated for white oaks. And Mm -hmm. it's a pretty robust, fairly long-term study with a pretty good sample size. Uh, that doesn't mean it, 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 it is the be all end all. And I don't want people to interpret that way, but what I do want you to do is think critically about what's going on and yeah. how that influences your decision-making. I, I mean, we could probably spend a lot of time digging up some examples that support and refute fertilization, but, uh, I haven't seen really strong evidence that in the context that most people would be fertilizing their oaks, it would be worth their time. Or money. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, personally for me, I haven't seen enough data to convince me that it's worth that time and monetary investment compared to other things that I could be doing. Yeah. And then, 
you know, you get stuff like this, even in this long term experiment, 25 Unless, years, they get that, you know, a huge investment of the oaks into production and then don't end up with more acres. Yeah. Yeah. Even though there more of them got produced on the tree, like it, it's starting to make sense to me now why we wouldn't be able to capture that. You know, maybe yeah. fertil- that, that's what they pointed out in the study is that fertilization is affecting so many different factors in the system that mm-hmm. would affect the uh, enemies of the oak. You know that it, that it basically just negated the benefits yeah. of the extra nutrients because it, they had extra enemies as a result of it too. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I, to caveat my point that I made just a minute ago about it not being worth my time. It, I think it absolutely could be worth your time in a situation where you're planting oaks. Um, yeah. If you're, if fer- you're trying to get them established or to maturity really fast, that yeah. is a completely different thing than trying to have a magic bullet to double acorn production. Yep. I, I don't, I think a lot of people are fertilizing with the understanding that they are doing that to substantially increase mast availability in near real time. Mm-hmm. And I just don't think that is a, a really feasible uh, outcome. Like it, it, right. I just don't, you know, maybe there are some circumstances where you get a little bit out of it here and there, or maybe even a lot in some cases, maybe if you do it for 25 years, but even in that example, it still didn't make more acorns for turkeys. That's right. You know, one thing that, uh, has really been surprising to me about this episode series is we've covered a lot of controversial topics that you think would get people fired up, but we've gotten, I mean, almost comparable feedback on this type on this topic compared mm-hmm. to some of those other ones that are really considered hot button topics in the turkey world. Yeah. That's a good point. It's good though. We enjoy it. Oh yeah. And I like to be challenged. Like, you know, uh, one of the other things that came up, I haven't been able to find anything on it, but I think it was a good counter. we got a listener that brought it up to us, I think. And then they brought it up on Mossy Oaks, uh, gamekeepers when we were on it. Uh, you know, we, we were talking about the oaks that are fairly unproductive, Mm -hmm. just taking up space. And then some people have been like, well, what if those are the ones that are key for fertilizing the, the ones that flower really well and end up producing acorns? Yeah. Which I think is that, that is what we want our audience to do right there. Think critically about all this stuff. Yeah. But, uh, you had a pretty good point when I, when we were talking about that earlier. Right. So, I mean, we've done experiments where we've removed those trees and acorn production doesn't go down in the trees that we leave behind. It actually goes up. Yeah. So, I mean, that's not to say that they weren't playing some role in fertilization, but um, yeah. it wasn't significant enough of a role to reduce acorn production in subsequent years. Yeah. Now, the uh, that comment is based on this premise that there would be del- there, there would be pollen limitation. Mm-hmm. So basically, there's not enough pollen to pollinate all the flowers. Right. Right now, even if there is some effect on pollen, it isn't enough to limit reproduction efforts in those remaining individuals to less than what it was before it was done. Mm-hmm. Right. So in other words, it. There could be still pollen limited, limited, but if you know if it's still a net positive, we wouldn't necessarily see that. Yeah, you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, we could really go down the rabbit hole on this though, if you wanted to. I mean, oh my there, gosh, there, there the are potentially hole ends in China. <laughs> is that yeah. how they get? Is that how they get all the stuff here from Amazon? <laughs> I'm pretty sure <laughs> through the uh, rabbit. Hole. I'm pretty sure a rabbit delivered my last package (laughs) good lord um i I mean seriously i think that was one thing that came up with the mossy oak uh this we're just like on the cusp of learning about all this stuff man it's so exciting to me like to to try to understand how complex a a simple plot of land with a few trees on it is you know right it is it is it's it's really humbling if you think about it Mm -hmm. but and to that point, too, though, I don't want to diminish the ecological role that some of those poor producers are perhaps playing. 
right? Yeah. There's there's things there like like you just mentioned that we don't even know, and we may never know what their role of those trees is or could potentially be. Um, I mean, maybe there's certain you know genetic characteristics that keep those trees represented in subsequent generations because of some important trait that it confers to the trees that do mm-hmm. produce acorns. You know, maybe it makes them more drought tolerant. Who knows? Like I could yeah, you know, throw out of things that- 12 different hypotheses related to how removing those individuals from the gene pool could have downstream consequences. But I think on the whole, based on, you know, all the things that we've covered so far relative to um, loss of early successional vegetation conditions, loss of woodlands, loss mm-hmm. of fire maintained systems, um, you know, overcrowding of oaks, overtopping of oaks, changing species composition and mesification of mixed hardwood forest. On the whole, I think that we're probably, you know, let's just say the landowner's objective is at the outset is just to expand crowns to increase acorn production among the good producers. I think that the suite of other ecological effects that come along with him implementing that management action is probably on the whole more positive than him not removing those trees. Yeah. Well, and I, I I said this when we were having this discussion off the air. We, I, I agree with you. We're not saying that, that you must remove the poor producers and leave them, but we are in a situation where the desired forest structure conditions, especially in upland hardwoods, is not present, and removing some trees would allow us to get closer to what those desired forest conditions are for many objectives mm-hmm. and uh, not just turkeys, but turkeys is certainly one of them. And the barrier to doing that often is the fear that you're going to lose mass production. Yeah. So we're just giving you an option so that you can remove some trees and get, you know, get all of the benefits of increasing sunlight while potentially increasing and definitely not losing mass production. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know, that may not be for everybody. If you want to implement a, a shelter wood harvest and try to go that route, there's a bunch of literature to show that that will give you some of the same desired forest conditions and you can do it commercially. So obviously that's a benefit to landowners and you're probably going to leave you know at random some poor producers and some good producers and you're trying to maximize spacing of trees in that case and uh there's literature to suggest especially with the application of fire that that can even enhance uh oak recruitment mm-hmm. so you know take all those things into consideration when you're thinking through it but i think right. Do do we have any other points of clarity or can we jump right on into the, we're like halfway into a halfway into the episode (laughs) and we're still on points of clarification. (laughs) You know, the only thing, the only other one that I I got, it's been listenable. Yeah, I do too. Um, and I think people appreciate this because we're learning as where they're, as they are learning, you know? Yeah. One, Um, we're, I like one thing I like about what's going on. It's fun to me in part, but hopefully people appreciate it as we're getting challenged constantly on these, on things that we say, and then we're digging in to the literature. Yeah. Like I just went and read a whole bunch of stuff on fertilizing trees in general, but oaks in particular that I had, I just don't read a lot. Right. And it was really fun to dig in on that and try to find what, what's going on. Yeah, I mean, when you're buried in the literature related to turkey reproduction, for example, like how much time do you have to go look at oak fertilization literature? It's hard to yeah. be a jack of all trades. You know, there's people that specialize yeah. in that and uh, you kind of hope that they're doing the work or you partner with them to do some of this work because you can only mm-hmm. you only have so much time in the day. But one other point of clarification that I was going to make really quickly and then we'll move on or I say really quickly, it may be we may belabor it out into another 15 minute conversation. But, uh, you know, we when we. I shared a statistic from a paper um, in the last episode where I said, you know, I think it was gobbler abundance specifically peaked at when about 30% of the landscape was comprised of hardwoods. And then Mm -hmm. after that, it went down. I wasn't saying that to then 
follow up with a management recommendation that if you have north of 30% of your property covered in hardwoods that you just need to cut all those down. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think many people would have made that inference, you know, from that, from that data, but just in case they did, I wanted to make that point of clarification. Mm -hmm. And also as we're about to go into, um, the reason that that abundance probably went down beyond 30% of the landscape in mixed hardwood forest is because that mixed hardwood forest was probably all mature closed canopy forest. For the most part, almost certainly was. Yeah. And with turkeys being generalist species, they need different stand types and ages to complete their annual, you know, life cycle. So Mm -hmm. if you diversify, you know, let's say you have 60% of your property in mature closed canopy hardwood forest. If you diversify that out and you provide for those other habitat uh, needs, within the context of that hardwood forest, you can still, you know, you can, you can move beyond that, um, that peak abundance threshold. Does Mm -hmm. that make sense? Did I explain that that well? I feel like that conclusion wasn't as solid as I wanted it to be. Yeah. I I think, you know, the, the results are within the context of the way things are being managed and you Mm -hmm. can implement strategies, force management strategies that change the relative importance Right. Of forest types because yeah. you've changed the the structure of it and how it's used by turkeys. That's right. E- even if you're in a landscape that's a hundred percent oak forest, you can manage some of that forest in such a way that it produces things that it usually without that management would have. Right. Like nesting and brooding cover. Right. Cool. So let's get more into the implementation of different silvicultural techniques to manage uh, mixed hardwood forest for turkeys. And I think central to this discussion is going to be uh, the way that we remove trees, right? So mm-hmm. the easiest and most obvious one for larger landowners or landowners that live in areas with strong hardwood, you know, pulpwood or hardwood saw timber markets is, you know, just commercial logging. Right. Mm -hmm. But a lot of folks don't have access to that because their parcel is too small. Um, There's not a market for it where they live and things like that. So that oftentimes that has us um, leaning towards herbicide injection in some format. Right. So Mm -hmm. more people are probably familiar with hack and squirt than any other technique. Um, And so that just entails making cuts through the bark into the cambium layer, the living tissue of the tree usually uh, at a spacing of every three to four inches around the tree circumference. And then you inject a a, a concentrated herbicide solution into each of those cuts. Probably the one that most people are most familiar with, or the kind of the go-to standard is a 50% Garlon 3A, 50% water mixture Mm -hmm. uh, for that application. And that's a good one. Um, If we want to go into it, we can. Uh, The only drawback to that solution is if you're killing hickories, that's garland's not very effective against hickories the other technique um that has become both yours and my preferred technique is girdle and squirt and Mm -hmm. that's thanks to dr craig harper that that introduced us both to that technique and so instead of you know hacking with a hatchet or a machete or something like that every three to four inches around the tree you're just running a quick ring around it with a chainsaw and then you spray an herbicide concentrated herbicide solution into that girdle yeah, I'm sorry. I'm typing one thing. Uh, we're going to link in the show notes a document that Craig wrote. Have you? I'm sure you've probably looked at yeah, this document before. I have. He has a really great extension document and forest and improvement, and it has really good visuals and kind of gives you a recipe. But yeah. one thing I was going to add with the Garlon mix. In this document, he points out uh, that he likes to use Garlon mixed with uh, Arsenal, Mm -hmm. Arsenal AC. And And that's what we tested in Mark Turner's study. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, so you're going to talk about that some. So there there are, like you said, uh, there are a suite of species hickories are one of the most common that garlon don't control effectively Mm -hmm. that the arsenal complements that herbicide and does well with. Right. 
uh, it is more expensive to add the two together, but it's also a little easier for people to deal with. So if you're dealing with a suite of species uh, that tri- the trickle pear garland uh, is weak on, like hickories uh, in the mid south, sour wood was another one I know uh, that we dealt with a lot when I was working with him up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, black cherry, th- those are tend to be on the weak side. The arsenal covers those pretty well. Yeah, but the arsenal also has some weaknesses, like it doesn't affect pine or uh, it doesn't do very well on. Let's see, he listed actually a bunch of things: honey locust, black locust, mimosa, redbud, the elms, wax mm-hmm. myrtle, red cedar. So. You know, one or the other can be effective in some circumstances, but combining them uh, can be a way for if you if you need a more broad spectrum and and don't want to, have to worry about yeah. those weak sources. But you definitely have to be a little more careful with the arsenal, yeah. Uh, which I'm sure you're going to talk about. Yeah. So we used that specific solution is 50% garlon, 40% water, and 10% arsenal AC. And you have to mix them in that order so that the arsenal and the garlon don't gel with each other. Make sure you put the water in between. I always, I have my class yeah. mix this because we, yeah. do, we do some forest and improvement as part of the habitat class. And uh, I always ask them, it's like, so if we just pour these two together, what are you going to get? And they all just look at me with a blank stare. And it's like, you're going to get jelly. <laughs> they won't spread through there very well. <laughs> so they learn from that moment. Uh, yeah. yeah, you gotta you gotta water down the garlic line before you put the arsenal in. Yeah, you do it once and you waste you know twelve ounces of garlic three A and you know a few ounces of arsenal and you won't do it again. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, in that study we didn't deal with a lot of those resilient to garlic species, um, except for hickory. You know, hickory was mm-hmm. the big one. And yeah. the hickory stems that we treated with just the garlon water uh, treatment, they were like 50-50 alive and dead um, several months after treatment. Whereas the hickories that were treated with the solution that contained Arsenal AC, pretty much all of them were dead. Yeah. And you have a, we did, didn't... Go ahead. Mark Mark authored a paper on this, right? Yep. Uh, yep. That's Turner at all. It. Yeah, that's yeah. Turner et al. I think it was probably around 2020. I'm not sure the exact year. Yeah, I remember it coming out, uh, so we can link that as well but, for people that want to look at it. Right, but w- you know, you mentioned that when you're using that uh, that solution that contains arsenal, that you have to be careful um, because arsenal can is it's a soil active herbicide. Um, it is particularly deadly against most of your hardwood species. They're they're fairly sensitive to it. Um, so if you go about, you know, splashing it around willy nilly, there's a chance that you're going to get some non-target mortality. And that was one of the if reasons. If you spill it on the ground. Yeah. If you spill it on the ground or, or you know, if you're plant. excessively spraying it into your girdle or your, or your hack cut, you know, and it's dripping out, then that might be a concern as well. But the reason that we wanted to include that solution in this study was not only to see, you know, how it broadened the effectiveness of control compared to just garlon and water, but also to see if we had any non-target mortality. So we had, um, I can't remember the exact number, but we tracked a lot of trees um, (laughs) that were, you know, probably hundreds that were retained adjacent to trees that were treated with the solution that did contain arsenal and the only instance of non-target mortality that we were able to document was a clonal sweet gum, basically a sweet gum that had root sprouted off of one of the sweet gums that we treated with the solution, and we got it too. So that was a, yeah. that was a win-win <laughs> <laughs> in that particular yeah. situation. But we didn't see any non-target mortality in the in the treatment areas um, that w- where we applied the arsenal solution. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. That's really, really good data. That is definitely a common concern. Right. And in fact, I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't capture this and, you know, the statistics that were published in the paper, but I have pictures of it and, uh, we could, we could even share them if we wanted to and have them pop up in the YouTube video. 
uh, I'd have to go back and search for those might be kind of hard to find, but I thought it was fascinating. <laughs> I, you know, Craig and Craig and I went out in, in Mark's research stands and we're looking at the arsenal treated plots. I need to quit saying that, but you know, arsenal was just a part of the solution. It wasn't just straight arsenal, but we went the out in those plots. It, yeah. yeah. And we, we had several places where we looked up and you know, there'd be like a, a white Oak, in the center of this clump of trees and we had treated five trees, you know, stems around that white Oak that we retained. And they were close enough that their canopies were all interacting with this tree, this white Oak that we retained. And you see, you look up at the sky and you see completely defoliated canopies of all the treated trees. And then our white Oak stands in the center, completely leafed out, you know, no damage whatsoever. Happy as it can be. Yeah. And then a lot of times those were conspecifics, the same species Mm -hmm. that we had treated that were directly adjacent to that retained tree. And that's important because a lot of folks think that there's an opportunity for root flash where the herbicide is transmitted through the roots from the treated tree to the retained tree if they're the same species. And we didn't see Mm -hmm. that either. Yeah. Well, that's good information. So, uh, yeah, as long as you're using the solution appro- appropriately, where you're getting it into the wound the appropriate amount, and you're not spilling it or anything, or right. letting it run down the tree, or right. however else you could do it incorrectly, I guess, uh, it d- doesn't sound like, at least in your study, that was a concern at all. No, but there are a couple other studies out there that have documented some non-target mortality. I'm not exactly sure what the reason for that is. Uh, we speculated a little bit about it a little bit in the discussion of that paper and thought it may have been related to differences in soil types. Um, but we'll post a link to that paper so you guys can read through it if you're interested in more detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So why would we use that treatment or how? Yeah, there's a variety. Yeah, there's a variety of reasons. Um, probably the most straightforward of which would just be for single tree selection. You know, we've been talking so much about acorn production. And if we have a stand where we've, we've identified, you know, a number of trees that produce on a more consistent basis. And when they produce, they produce more acorns. We probably want to remove the, the competition from around those trees. And so when I'm doing that. Re- yeah. Canopy release of the tree. That's right. Of your target tree. And so when I'm doing that, um, the first trees that I'm looking to treat to kill um, are obviously going to be those from a turkey management or even a deer management perspective, because I know there's a lot of overlap in the two, are going to be the ones that offer relatively limited value to those species. So, you know, mixed hardwood stands, upland mixed hardwood stands, you know, sometimes you'll have pine trees. Oftentimes I'll get rid of those. I'll, I will say this though, if you plan to burn them, Sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of a pine component mm-hmm. in that stand because it helps you carry I the like fire. The fuel. Yep. yep. And uh, so, but we can remove those. Poplars are a big one. You know, I oftentimes target poplars. Sweet gums, obvious choice to get rid of. Um, maples Red in many maple. circumstances. Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes and, there's ashes involved, yeah. depending on what your landscape yeah. context Green is. Green ash is a big one. So, you know, look to those species, particularly the non-oaks, the non-mass producing trees. Um, And oftentimes, if you're just trying to release canopies, you can do that without having to take out too many oaks. Mm -hmm. But if you find yourself in a situation where, you know, it's all oaks in the stand, you might start looking, you know, first of all, at the relative differences in acorn production between the tree you want to keep and the trees that you're thinking about targeting for removal obviously remove the poor producers first beyond that you might start looking at the growth form of the trees right and if they've Mm -hmm. got a split halfway up the limb or something like that i would probably target that tree for removal versus one that it's adjacent to yeah okay so we could use it for release or just opening up the canopy in general yep so we can use this some combination of both Yeah. So we can, with that approach, you know, if I'm just releasing the canopies, all I'm going to do is I'm going to go around my good producers and just kill any tree that has a canopy that's touching the canopy of my good producer. Now, Mm -hmm. if I want to do that 
and return some sunlight to the ground at the same time, then I'm going to be targeting additional trees for removal. So I'm moving out beyond those poor producer or those low wildlife value species that are directly interacting with my desired tree and moving out into, you know, removing some other low value trees and maybe even an oak here and there until I get my desired canopy mm-hmm. reduction. And in a lot of cases, like if we're trying to um, create like an oak woodland versus a savanna, we're mm-hmm. only going to just take it down to, you know, we want like 30% sunlight coming into the stand versus the typical mature hardwood forest where it's maybe five to 10% sunlight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was just thinking through this of, you know, a lot of what you're talking about, we're using some sort of treatment. It could be the timber harvest. If you're in a situation where you have trees that you can come in and cut, Mm -hmm. Uh, but you've been talking about these alternative practices as well. And it's been focused on, on dominant and co-dominant trees. We'll say. Yeah things that are, you know, the, the mature trees in the stand. Right. And I was thinking about that and there, it dawned on me another reason that I've seen it used. Uh, one of the first examples that I saw that I really liked, it was actually John Grucci that we've, I, I think we've had on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what two or well, yeah. maybe two times. Uh, but he, had implemented this treatment on a site that I came and, you know, I wasn't a part of it, but I got to come see it with him after the fact. And they didn't treat, I don't think they treated any canopy trees in that particular stand, but, uh, it, it has some relevance actually was, a uh, on the committee of a student, uh, that published a paper on this McDaniel et al 2021. We can put that in the show notes where she simulated, uh, the contributions of different species to the litter and then looked at how flammable the system was. So mm-hmm. would it carry fire or not? And I'm talking about things like maples and sweet gums and, you know, hickories and that kind of stuff. And then oak litter, a lot of our upland oaks are fire uh, promoting species. They have traits, especially mm-hmm. with leaf characteristics that promote fire. So, all that to say what they did in that stand was go in and remove a lot of the stuff that was not very flammable. Mm. And a lot of that was just mid story. Right. So it was the sweet gums and maples that were in the mid story. It was, uh, alms and, you know, uh, hop horn beam and all that kind of stuff, beaches. Mm -hmm. So, uh, they didn't, in that particular context, focus on the overstory. But the point I was trying to make with that is based on her study, it doesn't take that much contribution of those less flammable species contributing to the leaf litter before the stand doesn't burn very well anymore. Yeah. And this is another way that you can increase flammability. And I saw it in that stand where, where uh, they did that when they removed a lot of those species where most of the leaf litter was being contributed by the overstory oaks. It was then mm-hmm. much easier to burn, even though they didn't open up the canopy in that yeah. case. Uh, but if you pair the two, then you can really get a long way, you know, mm-hmm. having uh, the broken canopy, allowing enough sunlight for plants in the understory to respond to fire, but also creating a more flammable system yeah. you know, by removing some of these, these trees that are, you know, less desirable for makes not sense. just for turkeys, but also because it makes it less flammable. Right. Yeah. It makes sense. I think anybody that is listening, that's done much burning in hardwoods would wholeheartedly agree. I mean, it's so obvious Um, because, you know, if you're just used to burning in pines, you'll have, you'll have different slight differences in, in fuel loading and in fuel type throughout a pine stand, but not as stark as the differences as you see when, when a fire burns through a mixed hardwood stand and, you know, it'll get up underneath like a white Oak or a red or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just cooking right along. And then you come up to a water Oak and there's like a zone of inhibition. Mm -hmm. around that water oak where it's dropped its leaves for years and years they've compacted they've held in moisture that fire just doesn't penetrate yep and you know there's a whole laundry list of species that do that same thing i just use water as an example 
Yeah, no, that's a good good example. Yeah, I think in uh, in the study I was trying to remember, I, I just pulled up the abstract of it. Uh, uh, let's see. It was only 33% contribution, I think, from those those less flammable species. Yeah. Before you had a significant decrease in flammability. Yeah. That's an easy threshold so, to cross. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, she had to capture a bunch of leaves and quantify the contribution of all these species. Uh, and, uh, yeah, just the mid story can contribute that much. Right. So that, that's, you know, uh, separate from the effect that the direct sunlight is having, you know, getting right. the sun into the stand and, you know, having colonization of, of some of your bunch forming grasses and things that, that are really flammable, you know, those are separate effects from those, right. those things. But, uh, you know, if you're wanting to be flammable during the growing season, it's probably going to require sunlight and, you know, some sort of canopy breaking, uh, combined with removing those non-flammable species to really get to a condition. Yeah. If you're wanting to burn it during the growing season, I would recommend going down even uh, yeah. further in your thinning because i yeah, mean that leaf area, area that leaf area index is high for hardwood so they shade mm-hmm. the ground really well um and yeah, you're not to gonna us, get away with 30 30 percent yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely but um yeah. one other thing that i did I, I always try to point out when i'm having this discussion with landowners or even students is beware if you're injecting stems those trees are going to come down eventually so they will be a, a falling hazard for several years. And if that's an area that you, you know, frequently uh, recreate in or whatever, just be cognizant yeah. of that. And then also be cognizant of the trees that you kill. Um, if you plan to follow up in the stand with fire, which I recommend that you do, as we'll probably talk mm-hmm. about in just a second, um, that any of those, those snags that you leave, those standing dead trees that are adjacent to a fire break are going to cause a fire hazard, you know, for mm-hmm. that fire jump in the fire break. So um just be aware of that i think that's something that we probably don't do enough is everybody remember you know when you're killing trees or using fire you know those things are to be respected Mm -hmm. right take care to follow your local guidelines make sure you're if you're burning get your your permits in order and you know, your, your plan together, all those sorts of things, like do your due diligence to make sure you're doing all this stuff safely. Yeah, absolutely. And there's plenty of information and plenty of knowledgeable people out there to help. Right. And the other thing you want to think about too, is at once you start killing relatively large trees, they're going to drop their limbs first and their limbs are going to fall next to some of the trees that you want to keep that you didn't treat. Um, so if you're going to, again, follow up with fire, once you've opened that canopy up, make sure you clear that larger debris from around the base of your retained trees so that they don't just sit there and smolder next to it and end up damaging or killing that tree. Mm-hmm. Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey. To learn more about TFT, check out turkeysfortomorrow.org.